We know a lot about how education, income, wealth, all these resources contribute to social inequality. But we also all exist in social networks, and those networks are not random. In other words, people in our network tend to resemble us, and this has implications for social inequality. So usually when we look at the social networks in the United States, we see that there's a lot of homophily. In other words, similar people tend to be friends with similar others. So you tend to be friends with who are of similar status in terms of income, in terms of education, sometimes race, and gender as well. So studies show that a lot of the social behaviors are actually affected by the prevalence of those behaviors among our peers. So we're more likely to smoke if a lot of our friends smoke. We're actually more likely to quit if many of our friends decide to quit. So social networks can both be beneficial and they can also hurt us and force us into uh, detrimental behaviors. So some social scientists do in-depth ethnographic studies and ask people about their social ties and their influence in their decisions. So that's one method. And the downside of that method is you can't really do a very large-scale study and interview a lot of people, so you can't really generalize from it. Another method you can use is you can survey a lot of people, but then you can ask very limited questions, and you can ask them about their friendships, but you, you won't really get a sense of the structure of their social ties. You won't know about all of their friends. You can only get limited information. So a third approach which we took in this paper is actually use an agent-based model. Basically create an artificial world where you can control a lot of things and see how changing the social ties between people changes their behavior and changes the aggregate outcome at the system. And we basically think, can think about three different mechanisms through which social networks can affect us. So first is social learning. We basically look around us and see what others are doing and learn from them. And this way, certain behaviors can become more beneficial to us and less risky because we garnered this information from our social networks. Now, the second way social networks can affect us is what we can call normative influence. In this case, our social ties can provide sanctioning or rewarding mechanisms. So they can actively try to persuade us. So the third mechanism through which networks can affect behavior is through network externalities, where having a group of people using a product makes it more valuable at large. But there are certain differences. So we can think about um, a site like eBay, where it becomes more valuable to everyone if a lot of people are using it, because now there are more products available. So in this case, we would call it global network externalities. But you can also think about a different model like Facebook, where you care only about your friends and whether your friends are using it. In this case, Facebook only has a local network externality. We try to mathematically represent it so that we can clarify those mechanisms and then test it with data to see which of these three things is at work. So basically, we're trying to model with this formula how an individual decides to take a take up a behavior. So part of the formula is your individual characteristics and your attributes, the resources that are available to you, but then the other part is about what others in your community, in your social network are doing and how that affects your decision. So we can think about socioeconomic status and how that might affect whether people use internet or not. So you can think that people who have less education have less incentives to use internet. Or we can think that people who have less income have less money to spend on internet. And this will naturally create differences between different groups in internet adoption. But what we see in the data is even when we account for these socioeconomic differences, there's still an, a, a gap that's unaccounted for. The difference comes from social networks. So we said that internet can be more beneficial to you if more friends use it. Now let's imagine that there's homophily in networks, which there is. If a lot of your friends are from advantaged backgrounds, if you're friends with a lot of college-educated people, you'll have more internet users in your social network. In other words, you'll have more incentives to use internet. Now let's imagine the opposite scenario, where you come from a very disadvantaged background. Not only you don't have resources to you know, pay internet subscription service, but you also have less incentives to do so because very few people around you subscribe. So even if you go on the internet, you don't have many people to interact with. Your social networks exacerbate the existing gap between groups. 
So when we think about disadvantaged groups in our society who have less education, less income, less opportunities, their networks are also characterized by these very same characteristics. In other words, their networks do not help them in getting opportunities. So one example is advanced placement courses in high schools. Now, we know that if you take these courses, you're more likely to get into selective colleges, so they're beneficial to you. But they're also costly because you have to invest time and effort. If you have a lot of people around you who take these courses, it will be more enjoyable to study together and you can learn from each other. So the costs of taking the course are lower and the benefits are probably higher because you can learn from each other. But now, if we look at actual high school networks, there's a lot of segregation by academic status. So if you're a top tier kid in real life networks, you actually tend to have other top tier kids. In this case, you'll definitely benefit because a lot of your friends will be taking these courses. But now imagine you're a bottom tier kid you don't have any access, any social access to friends who are academically high achievers. In this case, you won't get any benefits. So we see, because of these differences in the characteristics of social networks, we see existing inequalities getting larger and larger and become enduring over time. So any policy intervention here should consider the social structure and the characteristics of social networks. The broader, the more diverse we can make people's social networks, the more they can benefit from the positive effects of networks.